Well, let me, let me read um, uh, verses 8 and 9 from Genesis 3 and open this time in prayer. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? Father in heaven, I want to thank you this morning that when we sin against you and try to hide from you in our shame, that you don't leave us in that place of estrangement, that you go looking for us, and that you seek to restore the relationship that's been lost. Lord, would you call us out of hiding this morning and call us back to vulnerability and trust with you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, brothers and sisters, um, last week, Pastor John talked about the fall of man out of Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7, the original sin. And this week, uh, I'll be talking about the effect of that sin, sometimes called the curse. What are the results of this cataclysmic fall from grace from earlier on in this chapter? And the short answer is alienation on every level alienation from the world from each other from ourselves and alienation from god so first we're alienated from the world as the land that the lord god had called good is now cursed bringing thorns and thistles second man and woman are alienated from each other as seen in the blame game and the power struggle that ensues Third, we're alienated from ourselves as seen in Adam and Eve's newfound shame. Over, we became alienated from our loving God. And that last point is where I want to linger this morning. How the fall alienates us from our holy creator on an intimate relational level. So turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapters 2 and 3, or you could pull it up online in your Bible. And I, I want to consider this ongoing motif of nakedness that we see in this story. So if the... That I was just sort of then I think the fig leaves are a sign of our more intimate relational discord with the king himself. Genesis 2.24 gives us the final summary about the state of humanity before the fall. And it's such a beautiful picture. It says, um, actually verse 25, it says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So the original nakedness of the man and woman was a picture of their original innocence and complete vulnerability before God and each other. So every aspect of their lives was laid bare before the eyes of God. And they trusted God with that kind of intimate information, 100%. They had zero concerns about his intentions or goodwill or loving character. And so it's at this most vulnerable place of trust that the serpent strikes. And what he does is he essentially accuses God of holding out on Adam and Eve, of not really wanting their true happiness. And this thought had never really occurred to them before. John Stott says that Eve believed that the devil was kinder in offering her this fruit than God was in forbidding it to her. And she discovered too late that her disobedience brought her not gain, as the devil had promised, but irreparable loss, as God had said. And he concludes, still today, the devil's favorite occupation is to make God's permitted things seem tame and God's prohibited them things seem attractive. And we see the end result of their agreement with the evil one in Genesis 3, 7, where Adam and Eve clumsily sew fig leaves together 
and make themselves loincloths. And I want us to listen closely to the reason that Adam gives to the Lord for hiding. In verse 10, he says, well, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And it's like, hold on a second. When did all this fear enter into the picture? When did their trust for their perfectly loving creator who had already made them in the image of God, when had that trust become so broken? As we read on to verse 12, we see even deeper evidence of Adam's broken trust. And I think oftentimes with this verse, we emphasize the kind of blame game that goes on between the woman and the man. Uh, but let's not miss the fact that Adam actually begins by blaming God himself. He says, the woman whom you gave to be with me. So did you catch that? The 6th century monk Dorotheos of Gaza writes, when a man has not the guts to accuse himself, he does not scruple to accuse God himself. And that's so true. We still do that today, don't we? Whether consciously or subconsciously, we think things like, yes, God, like I flew off the, hand, off the handle with anger again, but it's all because of this husband whom you gave me. Yes, God, I looked at pornography again, but it's all because of these bodily urges that you gave me. Yes, God, I'm not willing to trust you with my money again, but it's all because of these circumstances that you put me in. So it's these circumstances, God, that's what's wrong. It's this body you gave me. That's what's wrong. It's your cruel choice of a spouse for me. That's what's wrong. And in all these ways, we adopt the serpent's perspective and essentially say, it's you, God. You're the one who's in the wrong. You may remember in the story of Job that after Job finishes all his own questions and monologues, the Lord finally turns the table and asks Job a question. God says to him in Job 40, verses 7 and 8, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. He says in verse 8, Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me? in order to justify yourself. That's what the Lord asked Job. Would you condemn me in order to justify yourself? And if we're honest, guys, we should all answer, of course we would. That's what we do. Because we're exactly like Adam and Eve. We sin against heaven and against each other, and then we blame you for it. In fact, if we ever met somebody who didn't act that way, we would crucify him to make ourselves feel better. Actually, that's exactly what we did do. So the gavel of a just God, a just judge, was bound per to pronounce judgment upon Adam and Eve and the serpent. And his judgment that he pronounces matches the sin that each committed. So because the serpent had sinned by exalting himself, God mandates his low-to-the-ground humility for the rest of his days. The most crafty of all beasts will now be the most cursed above all livestock. And because he sought the death of man, man will now ultimately be the death of him. Because the woman ate the forbidden fruit, her own fruitfulness shall become pained. And because she ruled over her husband, he shall rule over her. Because the man failed in his God-given vocation to work and keep the garden from Genesis 2, his work will now become toilsome. Verse 17 says this, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. And here's the worst part. Here's the death sentence. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Some of you guys were at our good, or our Ash Wednesday service, and we'll remember that on Ash Wednesday we mark 
people's heads with ashes and the sign of the cross, and we remind them, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is the cataclysmic bad news of this passage and of the fall of man. And if it would have stopped here, God would have still been just in his judgments. But here's the thing. God is not just a judge. He's also a lover. And his love goes infinitely farther, guys, than we could have imagined. As James 2.13 says, mercy triumphs over judgment. And I'm not just talking about God's plan to crush the head of the devil through Eve's long-awaited seed, verse 15, although that would have been enough. And I'm not just talking about how he will replace our shabby fig leaves, verse 21, with the only sacrifice that can truly cover our shame, because animal sacrifice could never do that. It's the pure Lamb of God who could do that. And God does all this for us and covers us with his righteousness, and that would have been enough. And I'm not even just talking about his plans to give us access to his holy presence again by tearing the cherub-embroidered curtain that stood in our way. I'm talking about the lengths that Emmanuel, God with us, is willing to go in order to heal our broken trust. Because as Galatians 3 puts it, Christ redeemed us from the curse. How? By becoming a curse for us. Isn't that a shocking statement to hear? I mean, it's one of those things where if it's like, if it wasn't in scripture, we might think that it was some kind of heresy. But looking back to the judgment of Adam in verses 17 through 19, the curse, the pain, the thorns and thistles, the sweat, and even death, we see all this, all these become ingredients in our salvation because it was Christ who became a curse. It was he who bore our pain. The Lord of heaven wore a crown of thorns and thistles. It was he who sweated even blood. And it was ultimately him who was laid in the dust of death for us. And after such a glorious and self-giving salvation, how can we ever doubt God's heart for us again? When Satan comes and tries to whisper in our ear that maybe God is holding out at us, we remember, not this kind of God, not the kind of God who would save us in this kind of way. It's impossible. He's revealed his heart to us for all times beyond the shadow of a doubt. In closing, I want to quote at length from a passage I shared with you a few weeks ago, but it bears repeating. Christopher West, in his introduction to theology of, the theology of the Body, writes this. He says, in essence, Christ's life proclaims, you don't believe that God loves you? Let me stretch out my arms and show you how much God loves you. You don't believe that God is a gift? This is my body given for you, Luke twenty two nineteen. You think God wants to keep you from life? I will offer my own life's blood so that you can live life to the full. John 10, 10. You thought that God was a tyrant, a slave driver. I will take the form of a slave. Philippians 2, 7. I will let you lord it over me to demonstrate that God has no desire to lord it over you. Matthew 20, 28. You thought that God would whip your back if you gave him a chance? I will let you whip my back to demonstrate that God has no desire to whip yours. I have not come to condemn you, but to save you. John 3, 17, I have not come to enslave you, but to set you free. Galatians 5, 1, stop persisting in your unbelief about who I really am. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Taylor. <clears throat> That was awesome. Thanks for bringing the word. Uh, we, we, we've had questions coming in while um, while you were preaching. So uh, <clears throat> do you need a little break or are you ready to go right into answering some questions? Let's roll. Let's roll. Okay, great. So I'm going to take them roughly in the order of the text. They're all out of Genesis um, 3 and most of them are really hard. So um, we, got, we got the good ones. Uh, the first question is, uh, why is it? in verse 9 that God calls out specifically to the man 
in verse nine when he says, where are you? Why is he calling to men? Yeah, um, so that was a good observation, um, whoever asked that question, because you have to read the footnote to know that uh, in Hebrew, he's actually, um, the word you is singular. And some of the word, uh, most of the word use later on in the passage are plural. So he is specifically calling out the man. And, um, you know, I was reading something from Pope John Paul II um, earlier this week that was saying, um, it's as if God um, places a greater responsibility for the restoration of the relationship that was lost um, upon the man. Uh, it was him who was commissioned first. It was him who was originally given the command in Genesis 2. In fact, we see that um, Eve wasn't originally there. So either God repeated the command or Adam told it to her. And so there's a sense in which um, God is holding the man to account. He's, he's holding him uh, responsible in a greater way. And we also see that uh, in the fact that um, what he says to the man in 17 through 19 is actually quite a bit longer than what he says to the woman. Mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> All right, this second question is a really big one and it could be a sermon in itself, um, but maybe we can get the Cliff Notes version here. Um, the question is, we're looking at the curse of the woman. And the question is, how does verse 16 align with the complementarian view of marriage and of women in church leadership? Since the rulership of husband over wife by, and by extension men over women seems to come directly from the curse of sin. Yeah, that's a great question. That again? Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's a great question. Um, um, essentially, uh, um, the, the point that they're making is... Um, this, this, these pronouncements, these curses, um, I, I think just to back up a step, are not commands. They're not, um, they're not prescriptive, like God is saying, this is how it has to be. They're descriptive. So this is how it's going to be from here on out. So, for example, he says, I, I, sure, I will surely multiply your chain, pain in childbearing. That doesn't mean if a woman, uh, you know, takes some sort of... Uh, pain medication or something like that when she's in childbearing, that she's somehow disobeying God as if this is like a prescriptive command. And so um, we have to remember that the things that are said here, or, or if a man buys a tractor instead of plowing, uh, you know, his field by hand or something like that, that he's somehow disobeying God. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's important to differentiate between uh, the leadership and headship of man, which is spoken of in positive terms. I think before the fall and is referenced even in the New Testament, uh, references made to Genesis 2 in so many of those teachings um, with the uh, domination of man over woman, which is not, um, which is, which is a result of the fall and uh, has no place in, um, in the Christian life. Um, this, this power struggle between um, man and woman uh, that we see that's going to issue forth is part of what the Holy Spirit is wanting to redeem. He's wanting to redeem, uh, yes, I, I do believe, um, the kind of original leadership role of man, um, but it's a leadership role of service and not of rulership, not of, of dominion. We don't lord it over one another as the Gentiles do. Um, even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. And so I would want to uh, differentiate between um, uh, the domination that's implied here or uh, ruling over and, um, and actually a godly responsibility mm -hmm. or a kind of Christ-shaped headship. And um, I, 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 um, I think I would, would only add that it's interesting um, in the ESV translation, uh, the way that it translates, it says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and mm -hmm. he shall rule over you. Um, oftentimes, it's been um, translated, your desire will, will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. I think this is actually the better translation. Uh, this same phrase is used in the next chapter when talking about uh, the temptation that Cain is facing to murder his brother, brother Abel. And that's usually translated, its desire is against you and you must rule over it. So there's a sense in which um, it's not just that man wants to dominate woman. He's saying woman wants to dominate man. There's actually going to be a power struggle that goes on. So uh, both of us sort of have to check our hearts uh, in light of the gospel of Jesus. Yeah. 
That's good. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to stay with the woman. Um, the question came in, uh, when exactly did Eve sin? Was it when she recounted God's instructions to the serpent or um, that she misstated God's word, implying a lack of trust in God's goodness? Uh, or was it when she technically disobeyed? Yeah, um, in some sense, that, that's, a, that's almost more of a question um, to John's sermon from last week. Um, I think he did a good job of explaining about how her sort of lack of accurate remembrance of God's command contributed to the fall. But I don't think that was the sin. Um, I think that um, we start to see the sin described in her heart in Genesis 3 when you know, she sees that the fruit is you know, a delight to her eyes, all this sort of, you know, it kind of it explains it. And then so she takes and eats. So it's something that the devil is sort of drawing out of her heart and her own kind of sinful desire in that. But I think it's, it's sort of consummated when she actually disobeys the command. And yeah. Eats the fruit. Cool. Good. Um, so at this point, we've, we've got more questions coming in than I'm going to have time for. Uh, I think we're just going to do two more. Um, the question came in, uh, why did God come down so hard on Eve by saying he would multiply her labor pains? Uh, one of our members was startled by that language and said they'd have trouble explaining that to a skeptic. Why did God come down so hard on her? Yeah, I think um, I think it will will almost never not be hard to explain God's judgment to a skeptic <laughs> of any kind. Um, uh, I do think that there is a sense in this passage. I mentioned this in in the brief homily, and I'll, I'll talk about this a, a good bit more in the teaching that we put up online. But um, there's a sense of the way in which God punishes them uh, being somehow related to the way that they sin, and uh, so um, so I mentioned uh, Satan wanting to exalt himself and God humbling him to kind of slither. Um, the woman um, sinning by eating the forbidden fruit and, and it, it affects her own fruitfulness in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that um, there's a way in which the distinctive roles of men and women um, are part of what comes under a curse. Mm -hmm. So the woman was equipped with this special dignity of being able to bear children and to mother them and man um, was, you know, equipped with this ability to uh, be a worker who, who works the ground and, and, uh, and it's at that place that things start to deteriorate. Um, uh, but, but God's plan is not to leave it there forever. And it's interesting because um, in Genesis, there's this theme of, of every time that God pronounces a judgment, um, he also pronounces a mitigation of that judgment, even in that passage. So in this passage, we, we see, for example, um, uh, God clothing them uh, with the skins of animals. So there's this kind of, there's this covering for their um, insufficient covering of their shame. And uh, we also see a mitigation of the issue. Uh, it's actually a mercy that God drives them out of the garden um, because he didn't want them to live forever in this state. Now we know that he does want them to live forever. Another mitigation is is the promise of the redeemer through the woman. But just just to point out that um, whenever there's judgment in Genesis, there's always these kind of special promises pronounced. A, a good example in the next chapter is um, the the mark of Cain that God uses to make sure nobody, even though he's pronouncing this judgment on Cain, that nobody's going to harm him. Um, so there's several examples of that in Genesis, and so we begin to see promises of a salvation that overcomes judgment. Um, but I don't think it's easy to explain judgment to non-believers, and, and it's hard for us to deal with, too. I mean, we're kind of like Adam and Eve. We, we don't want to believe that we will surely die <laughs> if we disobey the Lord. Yeah. That's good. All right, so I think we've got time for one more here. Um, there's at least half a dozen other questions we're not going to have time for. But what I'm going to do, we have them in writing, so um, I'll, I'm going to make sure they get forwarded to Taylor. And um, he can find a way to address those maybe with uh, an email or something after the service. Um, <clears throat> I want to think about um, the effect of this curse on ourselves now. So the question came in that um, in Adam and Eve's case, they, uh, they had the opportunity to 
to obey, to do better. Um, so the question we have is now that we're living sort of under this fall and under this curse, and we're kind of born with uh, this dysfunction of sin in us, uh, is it not impossible for us to do otherwise than sin against God? And if it's not possible, how can we be held accountable for persisting in darkness? Yeah, you know, um, I think it's interesting because I, I think that the answer of the Bible is, is um, it wants to say both. It wants to say it's not possible because um, we, we are fallen and we're born into sin. But it also wants to say that we sin in the same way as Adam and Eve. So uh, Romans 5 is a, is a really good example of that, where it's, it's trying to describe the fall of man. And it's, it's kind of trying to blame Adam, but it's also trying to blame our sin at the same time. So I think it's, in some sense, um, they sin in a way that becomes indicative of our sin. I'll just say as a kind of last analogy, um, one that I read earlier this week um, of, of the fall, um, thinking of um, a, a family living in the South in a kind of um, early times for um, the settlement of the U.S., um, deciding to go to the market and purchase slaves. And, uh, and that being this terrible sin that actually sets their family on a pattern. And maybe three generations later, you know, the slaves might have a dispute with, with uh, their owner and say, you know, you're, you're doing this terrible thing. You know, you've you know, kind of captured us, you're mistreating us, all this sort of stuff. And, and yeah. they, they might say, yeah, well, I mean, it's not a decision I made, you know, this is a decision that goes back generations. I mean, I, you know, this, this is not, um, you know, it wasn't my, it wasn't my decision, but actually their decision is of the same kind. It actually upholds and perpetuates the same thing uh, that the sins of their fathers perpetuated. So it's almost like the Bible wants to say both, but I do think it's the case. And part of the reason why Jesus says that we cannot see the kingdom of God unless we are born again, unless we are born from above is that it's not just that we need to believe certain things in order to be saved or to try our hardest to behave in a certain way, but we actually need his miraculous intervention into our lives and into our hearts to give us a rebirth so that we're no longer just born of the flesh or of a husband's will, but we're born of God and of the Holy Spirit so that we, um, on this side of Christ, if we put our trust in him and been filled with the Holy Spirit, we we don't fall back into Adam. Uh, we lean into Christ and we ask for his transformation more and more into our lives.